Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today's roundtable discussion. My name is Shanti, and I'll be moderating our webinar as Connected Commerce Council's Technology Policy Fellow. So today, we're going to be discussing artificial intelligence and how it can help you save time and money. We've brought on an expert, David Baer, who is a seasoned marketing campaign strategist and an AI for small business specialist. Now, I'm going to start off with a little polling question. Um, please input your answers when you see the polling question emerge. Um, how many of you are already using AI in your day-to-day -day lives? And we'll take a second to look at the results. All right, so it looks like a good portion of you um, are already using AI, but regardless at 3C, we know the work of a small business owner never ends. So we're hoping that after today, you can either add to your AI toolkit, um, or if this is still fairly new to you, start putting some AI tools and strategies to work so you can reduce the time you spend on tedious things and focus on what you love and what made you start a small business in the first place. Now, before we begin, we wanted to share some research with you to introduce the topic of AI for small businesses. We'll have Lily Gillespie, Senior Research Analyst at RxN Group, take us through some of her team's research related to this topic and how small businesses are already using or viewing AI tools. Lily, over to you. Thank you so much, Shanti. Um, next slide, Rob. Thank you. So as I'm sure y'all have seen in the news, AI is not something that will arrive. It's already here. It's being talked about at tech summits. There are innovators talking to policymakers, policymakers talking about how to regulate this new technology, businesses talking about how to implement AI into their workflows, and news articles and academic papers discussing the ethics of AI, its impact on society, education, business, humanity, everything. Next slide. So what we found in our research is there are really three types of AI. There's the stuff of science fiction called super intelligent AI that is designed to outperform humans in all tasks, but it isn't really implemented or even in like existence yet. Um, and then there's also strong AI, which adapts and learns as it completes tasks and predicts what you want to know using pattern recognition. This could be like a chatbot learning from your prompts and improving its output over time. And then there's also task-specific AI, which is to handle smaller tasks. It mimics human intelligence, but it performs a discrete task. So an example of this could be an email filter for spam messages. It is designed to do one thing and it can't do anything past that. Next slide. So as many of you probably know in your own um, business life, you perform digital tasks. You can um, use now AI tools or AI integrations into tools that your businesses perform. And this could include AI tools or capabilities for customer service, marketing, logistics, video conferencing, scheduling, any digital task a small business performs, there is now a tool out there to help you handle it with AI. Next. And so based on some external research we've done um, earlier this year, Four in five small businesses are already prioritizing or considering implementing AI into their business. Um, the SMBs that were surveyed say AI provides a significant contribution to their business, especially for uses like marketing, workflow automation, and customer service. Um, preliminary results from our own 3C community survey validate this. Um, we found that 60% of business owners in the 3C community say they will continue using AI tools or explore adding new ones into their workflow soon. So this just demonstrates to us across the small business landscape and within our own network how many SMB leaders are already interested in AI and using it in their businesses. Next slide. 
Um, and so after our external research, we've also started conducting conversations with small business owners and entrepreneurs just like you to learn about the familiarity of AI and how it's been impacting small businesses already. Um, what we found is business owners express excitement for the new technology, but there's also a level of uncertainty about implementing AI tools into workflows. Um, what we've heard is that most people see the time savings that can come from this technology for scheduling, tracking inventory, drafting emails, creating marketing content, and using that time savings to spend more time growing their business, doing long-term planning and thinking creatively. Um, for example, I talked to a small business owner who runs a blog and he told me about how he integrates chat GPT into his writing process. The chatbot doesn't take over the writing, but it gives him a template to work with. And then he'll also use it on the back end with his finished product to evaluate questions his readers might have and perspectives that his article is missing that he can then add in. That being said, he also expressed and many other business owners expressed hesitation when embracing AI tools. Um, what we've heard from SMB owners is they're concerned with authenticity, overwhelmed by the quantity and quality of tools, and quite simply uncertain about the level of trust they should place in a new technology. Um, that they don't know much about. So today we hope to offer you an opportunity to learn and address questions around AI in a very practical and applicable way, whether that's giving you strategies for incorporating it into your business or offering a jumping off point to get started. Thanks. Thank you so much, Lily. Um, building off of the research she just shared, AI regulation will be highlighted once more later on in this webinar. While lawmakers are currently debating what regulating AI should look like, 3C is working to ensure that the small business perspective is considered in these conversations. Now, throughout the next hour, please drop any and all questions into the Q&A box, and we'll make sure to answer them during the Q&A portion of this call. Now, without further ado, um, let's dive into today's program. We'll start with a workshop led by David Baer, who's been in the marketing campaign business since 1990 as a strategist and advisor, and since he's become an expert in AI tools for small business operations. David, over to you. All right. Well, thanks so much, uh, Shanti. I appreciate it. And I'm going to go get my screen shared. I hope you can all see that now. Let me just... Uh, Get a, a yes or from someone in the chat that you can see, and we will proceed. All right, perfect. Thank you, guys. Much appreciated. So uh, this is, of course, an AI-generated image, because how could I not today, right? Um, so what we're going to cover in this portion of the workshop, we're going to talk a little bit about how to incorporate artificial intelligence into marketing activities specifically. I'm going to walk you through some examples of places where you can apply AI into a traditional marketing funnel. Uh, we'll do a little bit of chat GPT, show and tell, and then we'll open things up for questions. Um, very quickly, this is me, uh, not 1990, but 1996 is when I got started in uh, marketing as a classical uh, music and theater marketer. I've worked in the wine business. I ran a Facebook ads agency. These days, I uh, mentor and train marketing service providers and marketing agency owners. And I've been playing with AI in the marketing area um, for just coming on uh, four years now, uh, the end of uh, 2019. Now, Lily talked a little bit about you know, sort of the overwhelm, and I want to um, acknowledge that there is a huge amount of overwhelm, uh, particularly when it comes to the vast number of uh, tools out there. We're going to talk about that on the next slide, but I want to suggest that rather than starting with the tool, that you actually look at what's going on in your business, the things that you're already trying to address, challenges, problems, questions that you have, and then say to yourself, how can I apply AI to help me address this problem or question or need? 
There are a lot of websites which aggregate all of these many, many tools which are coming uh, at us really fast, by the way. Remember, uh, for those of you who are using ChatGPT, that platform came out last November. So not even a year has that been out. Uh, but a lot of the technology behind that platform and other similar platforms have been um, the engines behind many other tools that have come out since and some that existed before. This is a website uh, called there's an AI for that.com. There are many websites like this, which aggregate and list all of the many tools. This is a screenshot I took last week, and you can see right here the um, the number of uh, different tools that they had cataloged at that point, 9,028. It's actually uh, about 150 more than that as of this morning. Uh, but that's a huge number of tools for you to figure out which one am I going to use. So I'm going to recommend you don't start with the tool. Rather, you start with the problem that you want to solve. I want to talk a little bit about some of the, the most popular tools that are out there. Um, we're talking about marketing, and probably the leader in the marketing-specific space is a platform called Jasper. Um, this is actually the third name for the, for the platform. It used to be called something like Conversion.ai. Then they changed their name to Jarvis. Then they got a cease and desist from Marvel, and now they're called Jasper. But um, it's just one of many, many tools, as, as I said, some of the um, commonly used tools that uh, you can access for free uh, are ChatGPT. There's also a paid version of that. We're going to be looking at that today. Uh, Bing Chat, which has a lot of the technology that's behind ChatGPT built into it. Uh, Bard is Google's uh, platform. And then there's a company called Anthropic, uh, which has a platform called Claude. Now, these are just some of the many, many tools that are out there. And uh, these may be some familiar faces or names to you uh, that are coming out with new ones. Google is uh, teasing a updated or upgraded uh, AI that they're going to be releasing perhaps as early as December called Gemini. Uh, Meta has been working on and has released open source versions of their AI tools. And uh, X.ai, Elon Musk's company, is teasing something is coming out. We don't know exactly what that's going to look like. And Apple has something called Ajax, which uh, there's been uh, a little bit of news about as well. This is going to be a, a changing landscape. Uh, and as I said, this is all happening quite fast. So whatever we're talking about today may only be sort of uh, relevant for a short period of time before things are built on top of the technologies that we have out there. So I want to remind you the way that I approach the use of AI is to start with the problem, not the tool. Or in other words, uh, one of my very favorite Yogi Berra quotes, if you don't know where you're going, you'll end up someplace else. So how do we figure out how to apply AI? Well, let's look at where we're going. We're going to use this as an example, an acquisition funnel map. And this is, if you're not familiar with looking at these things, um, it's simply a map of how somebody might click on an ad in this case, go to a web page where they're going to opt in for uh, a lead magnet of some sort or a free giveaway or some information. They'll go to a success page and that success page might get them to uh, book an appointment. But not everybody books appointments, right? So we want to have a little bit of a, an email drip campaign to maybe remind them, come book that appointment. And then that appointment turns in hopefully to so, some percentage of sales, right? That's the, the core idea behind a funnel like this. Now, in each of these stages, we have the opportunity to use artificial intelligence to help us accomplish some of these tasks. I'll give you a, a couple of examples when it comes to the advertising pieces of this. Um, I'm going to look at uh, a couple of different platforms that you probably know and may or may not be using, but Google has, through their um, ads network, been experimenting with adding or layering both artificial intelligence and machine learning on top of their ability to uh, uh, to drive ads and drive traffic for us. This is a new version of their platform, something called Performance Max, which basically gives us the opportunity to 
fill out a form, input a couple of uh, pieces of information, maybe upload some images, and then we let Google do the rest for us. Now, what this means is if we have been running ads kind of the old way where we've been targeting and we've been trying to figure out who our audience is and deciding the placements of our ads, we need to understand that that these platforms are now uh, adopting a lot of this machine learning and artificial intelligence and are doing a lot of that heavy lifting and figuring stuff out for us. And so we have to be um, approaching the use of these ad platforms a little bit differently. So there's going to be a learning curve as we um, start using the new versions, the new technology that are built into these platforms. Uh, here's Meta. The um, the platforms um, include uh, obviously Facebook and Instagram, and perhaps we'll start seeing ads on uh, Threads uh, if if more than you know five people continue using that platform. Um, here's an example of what it might look like uh, to build an ad. Right. So you put here on the left hand side some base content saying, here's some information about what I'm promoting, and then it will craft the ad copy for you. Uh, same thing with the imagery. You can upload some images or you can say, I'd like an image of such a, such and such a thing, and it, it can then generate it or it can in this case, uh, add a background and do a whole bunch of other things that will give us a wide range of different ad variations. And then it can do the heavy list lifting of all of the testing for us. So that's the, the, the front end of the, of the funnel that we're talking about. But again, as I said, these are new versions of ad tools that we've been using all along. If you're familiar with sort of how you've approached it or you have a marketer working on your behalf uh, using these platforms, you want to make sure that there's an understanding that there's a new strategic approach to the use of these platforms. Now, I said new strategic approach, but what I want to tell you is that the marketing fundamentals, the ideas behind marketing have not changed. They've not changed in, in, in over 100 years since Claude Hopkins wrote scientific advertising. Um, they haven't changed since the 1980s when David Ogilvy wrote Ogilvy on advertising, right? They haven't changed since the 1990s when Dan Kennedy wrote magnetic marketing. These are core fundamentals that we want to keep in our business. So I'm going to talk a little bit about core fundamentals as we go forward and apply it in some of the demonstration that we're going to um, be doing in a moment inside of chat GPT. So here are two core foundational elements of marketing that I want to uh, make sure we all understand. The first one is knowing who we're selling to and knowing them deeply. You'll, you'll see in a moment what I mean by that when I say know your ideal customer. The other thing is that we want to understand that we want to differentiate our businesses from all of the other businesses out there. So we want to have clarity around our unique selling proposition or our positioning or, you know, there's a bunch of different words and concepts behind this that, that we uh, can discuss. I'm going to discuss one in particular that was shared in a book that I absolutely love from Al Reese and Jack Trout. It's one of a, a few books I highly recommend um, anybody who's interested in marketing read. It's called The 22 Immutable Laws of Marketing. They also wrote a fabulous book called Positioning. And I want to talk about one of those 22 laws, the law of category. It states, if you can't be the first in a market, create a new category where you can be the first. So this is sort of an extension of the concept of niching or focusing your marketing. And I want to dive into chat GPT now and talk about how we might actually apply this concept. So we're going to jump over here to chat GPT and I'm going to be uh, putting a bunch of crazy long, uh, complicated prompts in here. Uh, I don't want you to focus on the prompts themselves as much as understanding the concept of what we're able to do with these prompts. And if there's some follow-up discussion uh, that we want to have about the prompts, I'm happy to have that. But here is a prompt where I'm asking uh, for ChatGPT to talk about 
different categories that might apply to a particular business. So I've given it some uh, sort of general data about a business. I've made this up. It's called Acme Insurance. Uh, I was thinking about, uh, you know, what what could be the the most um, broadly applicable concept. And I, I figured we would all at least understand how the insurance business works. What is their pro their product? Um, they sell life and health insurance um, and other financial products that are based around the concept of insurance. Uh, I then, you know, sort of made up a USP and some some brand information. And I said that I want to have ChatGPT help me uh, by listing 10 potential categories for this business based on consumer pain points and unmet needs in the market. And so let's take a look at some of the ideas that it's uh, it's given us. Dual benefit insurance, wealth uh, protect insurance, future proofing financial products, um, retirement plus plans. And it explains what each of these are. Now, we're going to come back to this concept in, in a moment, but I want to actually jump over to uh, another book that I uh, that I look to all the time. Um I'm a, I'm a big, big uh, copywriting geek, and uh, one of the great uh, um, books that's often referenced in the marketing and copywriting space is this book, Breakthrough Advertising, by a fantastic copywriter uh, who was working through uh, sort of the, the 60s through the 80s, a guy named Eugene Schwartz. And he shared a number of um, core principles that are utilized in marketing to this day. One of these principles is something called mass desire. Instead of saying, I'm going to go create something and then try to convince people they need it, this concept states, let's go see what the market is already looking to solve and then put our solution in front of that desire. So, Let's jump back over to ChatGPT, and I want to talk a little bit about a potential prospect for this, uh, this insurance company. So again, another crazy long prompt. What I'm asking for here, and we're going to look at it, you can see how long this thing is, is I want to develop a, uh, a persona, an individual who might benefit from this company's needs and understand this person's desires, needs, wants around this particular area of interest, uh, insurance, right? So what are their dreams? By the way, uh, just to quickly explain what I'm doing, I'm saying, here's an example of the output structure. And that's why I've structured my, my prompt so uh, with so much detail is you'll see it's going to mimic this as uh, I think you heard Lily mentioned a few minutes ago, one of the different types of AIs mimics things. And so if we say, this is the structure of the output I'd like, that's what I'm doing here. So dreams, past failures, fears, what are their suspicions? Who are the, the common enemies? And then basically I've said, I just want you to create a role and a desired outcome for that role. And so in this case, we're talking about an individual who might have some interest in insurance. So I've created uh, a role, a recently retired 65-year-old single woman who's concerned about the long-term sustainability of her retirement funds and healthcare costs. And now it's going to mimic what we just uh, uh, gave it as sort of an example of the structure. And it's going to tell us about her dreams. It's going to tell us about her fears. It's going to tell us about her desires and all of the other things that I've asked it to give us information on, right? So this is helping us understand what the potential desire of the marketplace might be for somebody like this. So I'm going to let this continue working through. And at the end of this, we're going to now take a combined um, uh, snapshot of both the company and the persona that we've put together. And I'm going to put another chat in here uh, saying using, and then we want to pick one of those categories that it suggested. So I'm going to scroll all the way back up here and look at uh, some of these. Now, retirement plus plans. It's this is one of the suggestions. Insurance-based products tailored for those nearing or in retirement, offering both health coverage and financial growth opportunities. That sounds kind of cool and sounds like it might be appropriate for our 65-year-old recent retiree. So I'm going to slot that one in because what we're doing is we're, remember, building out the elements of that funnel. 
So here's what I'm asking it to do. Using the retirement plus plan category, combined with the above persona, this woman that we've just uh, created here, please provide the following. I want it to generate a list of five different potential offers that we might make, keeping in mind the concepts in Eugene Schwartz's Breakthrough Advertising. That's mass desire, which we talked about, market awareness, and what's what's known as market sophistication. How well does the market know this particular idea or concept? How many offers have they seen out there already? And so based on the way that I've asked for it to generate the results for this, it's giving me five different potential offers, ways that I can frame the uh, insurance company's information in front of uh, you know, this potential audience. And from that, what do we want to do next? Well, we want to figure out you know, back over here to our funnel map. Well, we need to capture that person's information. We usually do that in an exchange of information for a free giveaway maybe a checklist or a PDF or a webinar or something, and then we'll likely have to follow up. So those are the next things that we want to do. So based on this idea, I'm going to take one of these ideas, and I'm just going to pick one quickly here and say, I like one particular idea. Let's say, I don't know, the complete care plan. That's number four. I haven't read it, but I want to get through the, uh, the, the sort of the demonstration here. So I want it to now suggest five possible checklist style lead magnets that I could use to attract prospective customers for th this particular offer, right? So now it's giving me some ideas of different potential lead magnets, things that I can give away in exchange for somebody's contact information, all right? And so while it's doing that, I want to talk a little bit about this email follow-up concept because what we're starting to see is a lot of the tools that we have already um, that we're already using in our businesses are incorporating artificial intelligence into them. Uh, this is a, a one of my clients' um, Mailchimp accounts, and I was playing around in there, and I highlighted some text over here. And as soon as I highlighted it, this little thing popped up and said, hey, I can generate the copy for you. Just tell me what you want to write about. And so I, I put you know a little bit of info in there and I was able to generate the core content of an email inside of MailChimp. Um, for, for those of you who may be familiar with Keep or what's um, formerly known as Infusionsoft, they have built out an entire builder of all of their campaigns, landing pages, et cetera, inside of their platform. And we're going to see more and more of this in the platforms we're already using, already familiar with. So I'm going to jump back over to ChatGPT. I know I'm, I'm going at a, a rapid pace here, but I want to make uh, you know sure that you understand all of the places within the funnel where we can be using and leaning on AI to help us. So the very last thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to say, okay, I like one of these particular lead magnet ideas, and I'm going to randomly pick something since I haven't really read through them. Number five, decoding health insurance for retirees checklist. And then I'm going to say, I'd like you to write three emails. The first email is going to deliver the lead magnet to them and offer to provide further assistance if, if they're interested. The second and third ones are going to start moving them further down the, um, the sales process by suggesting that they get on a, a call or make an appointment. So I'm going to say um, that I'd like them to book a uh, discovery call at, uh, what do we call this company? Acmeinsurance.com slash call, all right? And now it's going to generate those three emails based on all of this information that we have previously uh, put in here. Now, sometimes it gets uh, uh, stuck and stops and thinks a little bit, but um, it's eventually going to um, give us the output that we're looking for. So uh, you, as you can see, here's the first email um, subject, welcome to Acme Insurance. Uh, and then here's the uh, the guide that was promised or the, the, um, the checklist. There's a second email, which is going to now suggest that maybe they get on a call and the third email is doing that a little bit further. Now, 
I can take take these uh, emails, I can refine them, I can ask for it to, you know, build upon these emails, add additional um, uh, content or uh, add additional benefits. So I might say, um, revise emails, add, um, uh, uh, further benefits uh, to sell the call. I misspelled sell, but it knows what I meant. It's pretty good at figuring out uh, things in context. So now it's giving additional detail to the emails. I'm going to uh, stop this particular um, part of the presentation. I have one other thing that I'd like to uh, quickly share with you, and then we can um, jump into a Q&A. So beyond the idea of emails, one of the things that we kind of want to figure out is, are our campaigns working? And one of the things that uh, these AI tools are really good at doing is parsing through data and then helping us analyze that data. So I'm going to show you a very, very quick example of one of the ways that I do this. And that's by um, assigning ChatGPT the, the role and responsibility of being my coach guiding me through um, a particular set of data that I'm going to share with it. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and upload uh, some data into ChatGPT. This is just a sample data set from uh, a wine industry client that uh, uh, that I've worked with. And it's going to follow my very, very long instructions again, basically saying, I'm looking through this data, and that's what it's doing, by the way, right now. It's looking through the data. It's going to summarize what it sees. It's then going to analyze it, and it's going to make recommendations. Now, you may have noticed I absolutely love uh, um, business books. And so one of the things that we tend to do in my business is cite experts who have written books on particular subjects. And so I have built into the prompt a request that ChatGPT look at the data in this particular data set and then help me think about ways I can use it by referencing concepts that are uh, in great books. So you're going to see that in just a moment. It's saying, okay, David, based on the insights, um, here are some things that you may want to do. Uh, and it's saying that I may want to focus on a particular income segment uh, of the data, and it's suggesting a book from uh, Philip Kotler called Marketing Management. And if I want to know more details about that, I can ask it. Um, it's telling me that maybe I want to think about re-engaging dormant customers, and maybe I want to check out Utility from Jay Bear, no relation, by the way, uh, and so on, right? Uh, Neil Patel's Hustle. And so if I want to get more information about it, part of what I built into my prompt originally is I can simply say, oh, yeah, I'd love to know more about um, this idea of identifying dormant customers. Let me go ahead and um, actually, I'm just going to go ahead and grab that and s ask it for more info. Again, I could misspell it if I want on that. And it would start giving me further details. So this is you know, one of many, many ways that you can play around with these tools to um, build stuff, to analyze data, et cetera. I want to give you one final uh, um, piece of uh, uh, advice, which is uh, something that I deliver daily in the email inbox, and that's in uh, a newsletter that I generate 100% by AI, by the way, um, called ideas plus AI, and it's book summaries that then talk about how do you apply the various ideas within these books by leveraging AI. Uh, you can grab a copy of it uh, and sign up at either the link that you see on the screen, uh, that QR code, or I just dropped the, uh, the link into chat as well. And that is it for me. Thanks so much, David. And now uh, we'd love to ask you some questions. Everyone, we encourage you to submit your questions about David's presentation about AI for small business um, using the chat box fun function. Um, but in the meantime, to start off, um, I'll kick it off with a question. Um, 
David, what advice do you have for small business owners who may be a bit daunted by the learning curve when it comes to becoming you know, familiar with new automated methods for completing um, their business tasks? Yeah, I, I think, you know, for, for those of us who were around uh, 15 or 20 years ago when we were going through another shift of adopting new technology, there's going to be a learning curve. And the the thing that I would say about artificial intelligence is the more we make it a, a regular habit to utilize it in even our daily lives, like um, download the chat GPT, um, you know, mobile app, put it in your phone. And as you're thinking through questions that you have on a, on a regular basis, right? One of, one of the things we often do by default now is go to a search engine and type in a question, right? How do I get to, what's the closest uh, location, blah, blah, blah. We can start getting in the habit of utilizing AI to answer everyday questions, whether they're personal or professional. And as we get more comfortable with that technology, it's going to be more natural to apply it to answering business questions that we have. Yeah. Right, no, that definitely makes sense. And now for another question, um, you know, I'm seeing a lot of questions about, about prompts. Um, is there a helpful prompt guide for ChatGPT that you would recommend? Yeah, I, I would say that there's, I, I, I would caution folks against buying a bunch of prompts and rather get used to understanding the core structure of a prompt, which is more about the context that you're providing and play around with variations on the theme, which is, you know, ask, ask a question very simply and then go back and try to ask the question with a little bit more information. And as you add more elements to the question, you're going to find that the quality or specificity of the output is going to change. And so this is, I, I think, something that we're going to benefit um, from going through the process of training ourselves however we individually best learn rather than going and finding a bunch of prompts and and copying and pasting um because the more you internalize that sort of process i think the more proficient you're going to get at uh, being able to use these tools effectively for your own purposes no, definitely. And I guess following up on that, how do you recommend saving your favorite prompts? Do you simply leave it in chat GBT or do you keep it offline? Uh, well, I'm happy to show you what I do personally, which is I have a uh, Notion um, doc where I catalog everything that I routinely use and also things that I like. Um, I so I move it off of chat GPT just in case I ever lose that chat or lose access to that platform or decide I want to move to a different platform. Um, but I'll, I'll show you a very quick glimpse of, of what I do. Uh, and again, I don't recommend <laughs> this for everybody, but um, this is where I keep all of my prompts and I've categorized them uh, with tags so that I can simply, uh, you know, find the ones that I'm after uh, pretty quickly. Um, so, you know, here's here's an example of how I keep all of my uh, prompts and all of the prompts that I was quickly showing today, I was just pulling out of Notion because I set them up, you know, ready to grab and copy and paste uh, to be able to demonstrate quickly today. Great. No, thank you so much. Um, and I guess now veering into um, MailChimp. Um, for platforms like MailChimp that have or that already have AI integrated tools, how do you recommend um, a small business owner uses them while still sounding on brand and authentic to their business's you know voice? Yeah, I, I think each of these platforms is going to have uh, varying degrees of sophistication of what they've incorporated into the platform, and so the the part of your question that relates to being on brand and, and having consistency may or may not be part of what's built into some of these platforms. I was showing you MailChimp. In my very limited experience with it, it's fairly rudimentary. I can't add all of the brand voice and specificity around what that, you know, a business does in that one. 
But if you use a platform like Go High Level or um, or, or uh, Keep or you know HubSpot, they have greater sophistication in terms of um, storing you know, uh, base knowledge, base information around a, a business that you can go back and reference brand voice and things like that. I, I think this is going to be changing and changing pretty quickly over time. So what I think we see in MailChimp today is likely going to change over the next few weeks or months. And so I, I would, I would say just understand the context of the environment you're working in to know what limitations you may have uh, when when saying, oh, great, AI now exists in this platform, it may or may not actually be all that helpful. Right, that's true. And I guess, you know, keeping in mind the limitations, are there any concerns about copyright infringement um, if you're using AI content um, verbatim? I, I don't have any uh, evidence that I have seen that copyright is directly a result of uh, use of AI. Uh, and, and it has to do mostly with the way that these tools generate the output. They are not going and searching the web and taking a phrase and dropping it into its answer, but rather they are on each individual result um, generating what they think is the most likely next letter or word to appear. So uh, that said, Yes, the way that you ask questions could result in, um, you know, some something that is either untrue or uh, or or taken from some other location, um, and so you want to you want to be careful about uh, um, just cutting and pasting all of the results if you're generating content. Uh, with AI, and rather read it, review it, and decide, is this something that I would have uh, written on my own or be comfortable to have my name associated with or my business associated with? Right, definitely. You know, thank, yeah, that's very helpful. Um, and I saw someone put into the chat that um, SCOTUS rule that AI can, content cannot be copyrighted. So yep. thank you for that tidbit of info, um, Christy. Um, and now, you know, we have a question that's about creating videos from scratch using AI. Um, can you shed any insights on if this is a possibility uh, for video generation using AI? Yeah, from scratch, there are a few different ways that you can do this. And there's, again, tons of tools out there. I think um, so there's there's a lot of tools that uh, can generate um, videos based off of something that already exists. Um, uh, there's a platform called Runway that uh, is really good at taking an image of, let's say, uh, uh, you know, a person walking or a vehicle moving and then transforming it into something else. Um, taking videos of people who are talking, like me, a talking head to a camera, and being able to... Um, you know, a, a, adjusted or adap a, a, adapted in, I could um, add words that I didn't actually record and have those added to my script and have a, uh, an avatar, you know, video version of me saying those words in addition to, or instead of the things that I recorded. So those are sort of the things that are working um, right now with video. Um, the, the, that said, a lot of the video generation stuff is much more limited in its creative capacity, um, simply uh, because you need to um, have a lot of um, bandwidth and a lot of uh, um, uh, space to be able to build all of these things. And the technology is not there to do something that's really long. So we're getting a lot of like short version videos um, that can be generated at this point. But there's a lot of development in that space, and and I'm excited to see what comes over the next uh, year or two. Yeah, definitely. No, that sounds very exciting. Um, and now, you know, I'll ask one of the final one or two questions. Um, how do you reassure clients who may be a bit more skeptical or cautious of adopting AI tools into their operations? So I, I would say, you know, most of the complaints or concerns that I get around adoption of AI have less to do with the very real and, and appropriate questions about ethics and about uh, about um, uh, security and have a lot more to do with concerns about 
why do I have to learn yet another technology? You know, I'm already struggling with the technology that I'm dealing with uh, already. And, and so um, I would say that it's really a question of uh, what you, where, where we see our businesses as they relate to our industry, our competition, uh, how quickly we can um, accomplish things or up-leveling the quality of output of our staff, of our teams, in order to accomplish the goals that our businesses have. And do we see artificial intelligence uh, and machine learning and all of the other associated technologies, automation, as things that can help us accomplish those business goals that we already have? That's really the core question, and I don't have an answer for it. I'm I'm simply, you know, saying, is this something that you you would you want to add to your arsenal of tools, and you know, make make that really the discussion rather than is this good or bad? Because I don't have an answer to that that one. Right. No, that makes sense. Um, yeah, it's definitely a lot to a lot to think about. Yeah. Um, um, and I guess as the final question to kind of to kind of wrap it all up, what do you think will differentiate businesses who don't integrate into the integrate AI into their day to day tasks or business model versus the ones that do? I, I'm not sure exactly what is going to happen there. I, I can't forecast the future, but I can say if we look to the past in terms of adoption of technologies that are as widespread as this. You know, there's going to be businesses, and, and we see them today, businesses that have chosen never to go online, uh, have chosen never to participate in, you know, websites or uh, use of social platforms. And there's obviously positives to those things, but there's also negatives and understanding what the potential implications when you're dealing in a competitive space might be if you choose not to adopt technologies where your competition is. Definitely. Yeah, it can, it'll definitely, you know, I think play a role in staying ahead of that, that curve, but David, um, thank you so much for your time. This concludes our Q and a portion. Um, and yes, thank you for answering all these questions for, and for all of your insights. Um, and now uh, let's welcome Rob Retzlaff, Executive Director of Connected Commerce Council, who will now be discussing 3C's perspective on the state of AI policy today. Awesome. Thank you so much, Shanti. And thank you very, very much, David, for that fantastic and very invaluable presentation. Um, I, for one, learned a couple of cool things on how to use AI for small businesses. And I think, you know, those prompts and the questions that people have been submitting are key um, to trying to utilize and better understand how best to use AI. Um, so with that, I, you know, also want to thank Shanti. She's our tech policy fellow here at 3C as well for doing a great job at emceeing and moderating today's discussion. Um, so today I want to talk really briefly just kind of about what is going on current state of affairs when it comes to AI tech policy uh, to help you as small businesses to better understand how lawmakers are considering regulating artificial intelligence. Um, right now, lawmakers at all levels of government are considering regulating AI technology with a focus specifically on privacy, bias and discrimination and safety. And so for small businesses, it's important just to be aware of these potential regulations as they would potentially have a significant impact on your day-to-day -day operations. Um, with that being said, as some of you may have seen in the news today, uh, specifically related to President Biden's executive order, uh, there's a lot of po political momentum for AI regulation and it's never been stronger than it is right now with that first executive order taking place yesterday on AI to help guide federal AI governance. Um, the goal of President Biden's administration and his comprehensive plan is just to help ensure that the United States leads the way in development and of use of safe and secure and trustworthy AI platforms and systems that covers a wide range of topics. Um, in his executive order, which I encourage anyone interested in checking out. Um, topics include protecting Americans' privacy, advancing equity and civil rights, standing up for consumers and workers, and promoting innovation and competition in the marketplace. Um, 
as you might also know, there is also a strong bipartisan effort in both chambers of Congress, uh, Congress in the Senate and in the House to respond to AI and come up with policy on how best to regulate it. Um, earlier this summer, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer unveiled a policy framework for the development and regulation of AI called the Safe Innovation Framework, which is based on five principles of AI. It's security, accountability, foundations, explainability, and innovation. So with that framework, uh, he hopes that it will protect the national security of the United States and promote economic growth and essentially ensure that AI benefits all Americans. Um, as you can see in Sh Senator Schumer's quote, he's emphasized that we cannot afford to bury our heads in the sand on this important issue. And he understands that there are a lot of important issues and a strong need for government to try and regulate AI before it's too late. Um, another member of Congress, Congressman Liu uh, from California, who is part of the House AI Caucus, believes that federal regulations should be aimed at maximizing the benefit of AI and minimizing the risks of advocating for a cautious and critical approach to AI policy, at least initially. Um, and on the other side of the aisle, Congressman Jay Obernolte, who is also part of the House AI's caucus, uh, advocates for a human-centered AI regulatory framework, highlighting the importance of defining the purpose of regulation and cautions against leaving regulatory responsibility primarily to states, um, as they might potentially stifle innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, what's interesting is that in the uh, executive order that uh, was announced yesterday, the Biden administration is also calling on Congress to pass a bipartisan national data privacy bill, uh, saying in his speech yesterday that this executive order represents bold action, but we still need Congress to act. So, you know, what's important to note here is that there is a strong need for comprehensive privacy laws and AI laws in place, um, but there's nothing there at the moment, um, and this could potentially result and a patchwork of AI regulations in states all across the country. So with that being said, as you can see, there have been a number of congressional hearings on AI this year with over 40 bills being introduced related to AI itself. Um, the landscape of AI tech policy is dynamic and ever-changing um, with a surge of legislative activity making it clear that AI regulation has become a top priority for lawmakers in the US. So it remains to be seen how policymakers will navigate this intricate landscape. And it's a topic that will continue to shape our future. So with that in mind, I encourage you all to reach out to us at 3C if you want to learn more about AI tech policy and what you can do as a small business leader to make sure your voice is heard in this very timely and important policy issue. Um, all of those that are uh, have attended, you'll be getting an email here later today uh, with a recap of this event and a recording and the slides of this uh, presentation. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Shanti, and we will go ahead and conclude our workshop. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Rob, for shedding light on the state of policy um, and AI today. Um, we'll close off with a final polling question. Are you interested in learning more about AI for your small business with 3C? And feel free to answer yes or no um, when the question pops up. And we'll pause for results. Okay, well, I already see some support in the chat, which is great. Um, and yes, you will be getting a copy of this session. Um, well, good thing. It looks like everyone is interested in finding out more about how you can use AI for your small business. Um, so please look up, um, look out for a follow-up email from Kat after this event, including where you can reach David um, and a save the date for another upcoming virtual workshop on AI tools for small businesses coming up on November 21st. Um, and we'd like to thank you all so much again for joining us. You will receive a copy of the webinar um, in that follow-up email. Um, and again, contact information to ask any further questions, either to David or to Connected Commerce Council. Um, and with that, uh, have a great rest of your day and happy Halloween. Uh, thank you so much for coming.